It's so good to see each and every one of you this uh, morning. And so we're going to have a special class today on deacons. And just like uh, Brother Alvin said this morning, uh, there are some opportunities in the congregation for men to step up and to be deacons. And so we're going to take some time to look at what a deacon is, the role of deacon, and why they are so important in the work of the church. And so if you have your Bibles this morning, I know you do, turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 3. And we'll be looking at that passage in a moment to look at the qualifications of a deacon. And so, uh, deacon. What is a deacon? And so the term diakonos is used in the New Testament. Uh, It is used in numerous ways. It is used a few times to refer uh, to Christ, like in Romans 15, verse 8, or Mark 9, 9, 45, to refer to the apostles. Paul's co-workers are called deacons in 1 Thessalonians 3, 2. Missionaries in the early church are called deacons in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. Evangelists in 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. It says that as Christians, all of us are supposed to be uh, servants or deacons, John 12, 26. Even civil magistrates, so even people who aren't Christians uh, who are used in the government capacity in Romans 13, verse 4, are called deacons. Also, messengers of Satan are called deacons in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 15. In John chapter 2, verses 5 through 9, it is used for just a waiter at a party. And so it is important for us to realize what is it talking about? In Philippians 1, uh, 1 we're talking about a technical term used for an office in the Lord's church and a local congregation. And so with all these different aspects, we have to ask ourselves, you know, in the context of the New Testament, depending on what passage we are, the key to understand in any passage is context. And so we have to realize well, when it says deacon, diakonos, what is it referring to? What does it mean? Well, the actual translation would mean a servant. But right? if you're a diakonos, you are a servant. And so you can kind of see how this label would fit for Christ or the apostles or an evangelist or missionaries or as Christians in general. You can see how civil servant is an actual term that we use uh, even in today's uh, governmental post. You can see how all Christians are meant to be servants. But there are some passages in the Bible where the, the term diakonos or deacon is set aside for a specific role within the congregation that is an official uh, capacity held by individuals. And so what do deacons do? They serve the needs of the local congregation by fulfilling duties entrusted to them by the overseen elders. And so, of course, one of the main takeaways in our sermon this morning is who has a responsibility to be a servant in the congregation? Everyone, right? So we're all servants. And so if we simply say that deacons are servants, it's kind of a misnomer, right? Because we are all servants. And so what, what kind of servants are these? Well, these are men who have been entrusted with a specific task by the overseen elders to carry out one thing. And so you can see on this sheet right here that we have in the foyer, uh, you know, we have the youth. You know, we have the elder over the youth is Alvin Pratt, and the deacon over the youth is Lance Cobb. And so Lance Cobb has been given the, uh, the position of deacon over the education, or I'm sorry, over the youth for the purpose of ministering to that 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 service, that, that area in the congregation. And so we can see that now does everybody should everybody help serve the youth any way they can? Well, absolutely, right? But everybody's job is nobody's job, right? And so you need to have somebody there who is specified and placed in that position to be sure that certain things get done and don't, well, I thought somebody else was going to do that or make sure that was set up. So we have to make sure that's there. And of course, I think in God's wisdom, He set up the church to have those um, fail-safes, if you will. And so what are the qualifications of a deacon? And this is what the Bible talks about in 1 Timothy 3, verses 8 through 13. And let's read that passage together. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Let them also be tested first, and then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. 
Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so here we have the uh, illustration of what a deacon is supposed to look like, the qualifications of what that office is supposed to have. And so here we can see here the first one is to be dignified. And of course that means exactly what it sounds like it means. Uh, to be dignified also refers to the term to be holy, to be set apart. As Christians, all of us are to be holy. The passage we read this morning from uh, the epistle of Peter says that we're supposed to be a holy nation. Well, what does holy mean? Set apart. Somebody said over there, right? So to be dignified is the same way. As Christians, we're to be set apart. You need someone who's going to be a deacon, deacon who is dignified. Uh, they don't go out and act with their friends in the same way they act. There's someone who takes the call of Christ seriously. There's someone that is living not a perfect life, but a faithful life. Someone who is actively trying to live a faithful life, and you can see that on them. They have a sort of sense of dignity about themselves. They're not going to uh, wallow in the pit of sin and become un undignified, if you will. Uh, the second qualification is they're not supposed to be liars. And so uh, the Bible says that God hates six things, yea, seven. And in that list it says that God hates a lying tongue. And so uh, Jesus calls Satan the father of all lies in the book of Matthew. Uh, so the Bible is pretty, pretty staunch in the fact that as Christians, we should be telling the truth. We should be truth tellers. And so uh, a deacon is not supposed to be a liar. But just like being dignified, all Christians are to be dignified. All Christians are to be set apart. All Christians are not supposed to be liars. And so you need someone who is going to be able to uh, tell the truth in any and every situation, even in situations where it might be... Um, tempting to lie or to fudge the truth a little bit, but you'll need somebody who's going to, you know, uh, if you go to court, they tell you to tell uh, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. No, wait a minute. I've been to court very often. Uh, anyways, they go, it's like three phases to make sure that you tell the whole truth, right? You don't withhold information. You don't change information. Someone that's going to be somebody who's going to tell the truth in each and every situation. Once again, that should be the, the goal for all Christians, but especially those who are going to serve in a public capacity. Uh, the next thing is to be sober-minded. Now, the text says, not addicted to much wine. And so, if you look at the qualifications of an elder in the previous office, it says, not given to wine. And then, of course, the deacons, it has changed a little bit to not given to much wine. And so, the basic idea here is you want someone who is sober-minded. Uh, their, their senses are not clouded, whether it be through intoxication, whether it be through uh, pills or some other type of addiction, but somebody who can think clearly. Uh, why would it be important for somebody to be sober-minded who is a deacon? Yeah, you've got to make decisions, right? Um, is this different than the call of Christians in general? No. So once again, this same qualification for a deacon is a qualification for, to be a Christian in general, to be sober-minded, to live in such a way to where we are not a slave to anyone. The Bible says that we should not be slaves to anything except Christ Jesus, right? And so we've got to be sober-minded in what we do. And so uh, we won't talk about this this morning because there's not enough time. Uh, some have used this passage to say, well, it's okay for Christians to socially drink because elders are said not to be given to wine and deacons not to much wine. Uh, I, would, I, would not, uh, I would not agree with that statement. Now, we don't, this is not a you know, social drinking class. We can have one of those in the future. Uh, but that's not what this text is saying. It's saying they need to be sober-minded. They need to be able to think clearly and have their senses about them at all times. Uh, the next thing is not to be greedy. Now, why is it important for deacons not to be greedy? Sometimes they handle money, right? You've got deacons who are in charge of the treasury, uh, who are going to be having access to accounts. Uh, they're going to, you know, people all the time, right? Somebody will come up to me and say, hey, I wasn't here this morning or something, and they'll give me their contribution and say, you know, give this, you know, to, to whoever it's supposed to go to, right? And I can slip that cash in my pocket and... Nobody ever know about it, you know? But as a deacon, you can't be greedy. You know, you've got to realize the fact this is not my money, it's the Lord's money. And so you go and you put it where in the proper place. And so oftentimes... There's more to it, I think, than that to the extent that not only are you not to be wanting to touch it your own self, but you also have to recognize that the 
decisions that are being made, the responsibilities that are before you involve more than accumulating the pile of money, even for the church. I think it's a great point. And so uh, oftentimes congregations can be guilty of being greedy with their own bank account and not using that money for the service of the Lord and His church. Well, uh, I don't, no, no reflection upon bankers, but I don't think you ought to have a set of deacons and, or elders who were all bankers and financial analysis. Yeah. Well, I mean, certainly one could be a banker of financial analysis and be a good elder or deacon. But, but if we look at the eldership like a board of directors that make sure there's more in-go than out-go, and that's their main job, uh, if we feel like someone has to have a... Uh, I know that's what you're saying. Sometimes we feel like people and elders must be CEOs of, of big businesses or have some business acumen. And, of course, those are good things. Um, but some of your best elders could be someone who's worked for somebody else their entire life, but who understands the Bible and the role of an elder in the church. Uh, and so sometimes we do maybe look at elders too much like those uh, financial, that board of CEOs or uh, board of trustees than what the Bible describes as an eldership. And so... Yeah, yeah, I understand. But there are some practices in secular businesses that are good, right? Um, like you don't spend more than you make, you know, which would be a good principle to have in the congregation when it comes to the budget. Uh, but to run, but to run the the Lord's church uh, as a multi-billion-dollar business would run uh, would be a disservice to the church, uh, because a lot of times, um, and, and one of the dangers I think that happens, which I think is what what both your brothers are talking about, is oftentimes we separate the spiritual aspect of the eldership or the deacons and just focus on maybe the more um, administrative. administrative roles. Absolutely. And so, when, of course, the Bible tells us that well, one, of the, one of the terms for shepherd is a po, uh, pomeo, like to shepherd, right? To be a shepherder. And so you've got to know your sheep, just like Jesus in John chapter 10. And just like a deacon is supposed to be in the congregation and know those individuals. And so, yeah, I think you're, they're not greedy with money or with time or even with, with their service. I think about an old man, though, that used to run the Sun Drop Bottom Company in between here and Chattanooga. He said the hardest people for him to deal with in his county were the people who ran little churches. And I knew Mr. Milder, and he was, I thought, a religious man. And that was an interesting statement to say little churches were the... He says... Says they've never run anything else except that little congregation, and they want me to have cold drinks set up behind their door just as quick as they say amen, and they don't care whether I go to my church or not. Yeah, and there is a responsibility of a ministry, even for deacons, mm -hmm. but there's also the idea that you don't spend all your time administrating and not ever worry about the soul of people. Right, and once we do, the church will suffer for it. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. And so, like you're saying, it, it's, it's a marriage between administrating and serving. And so, just like that is for the eldership or the deaconship, both have to be present. Yes, Miss Kathy? You, you probably touched on it or just kind of saying what you're saying. <coughs> you're greedy, you kind of um, you're greedy yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the bank, the money looks better in the bank account than it does in somebody else's belly or somebody else's roof or, or something like that. And so absolutely. And so it's important. Also, um, with greedy when it comes to finances, but also I think of somebody who is, um, you know, power hungry. You know, the, and, and I've never known, I mean, I'm sure it's happened before, uh, not in my personal experience, but, I mean, the church is, is, is a big and there's many congregations. You know, uh, so the office of deacon, most time it's like pulling teeth to get somebody to be a deacon, right? And so uh, sometimes people may become a deacon and be power hungry, you know, and, and try to, you know, assert, you know, influence or whatever it might be. But um, oftentimes that's not really the case, you know, as far as being greedy for, like, you know, attention or for power. And so... Uh, but that that they can't be greeting that aspect either. So, any other comments uh, so far on what we've talked about?
you know, I think we've gone back and forth from comparing the corporate world with, with the uh, with the church. And you know, I don't think there's any good lessons the church can learn from the corporate world, but the corporate world can learn some great lessons from the church. Oh yeah. If you think about it, how many people would have thought a restaurant would become the number one chicken selling in the world and only operate six days a week? Yeah. No. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. When you serve, it makes a difference. I knew a guy, Brother Bill Davis, who is a preacher and elder in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, he calls himself Dark Chocolate because he's about six foot three and about three hundred and twenty pounds, and and is he's, he's a black guy and uh, but great guy. He was in the military for United States Army, I believe, for like twenty something years, and um, he was asked one time to speak at an officers' dinner on leadership and uh, so he preached a sermon basically from John 13 which of course is where Jesus girds himself we use that illustration this morning sermon and washes the feet of the disciples and so brother Bill Davis said that he asked them he said how many will, how many of you officers are willing to wash the feet of those under your command <laughs> and, he, and he said they never invited me back to speak <laughs> And so, uh, but, but you're right. And what he was trying to tell them was that a real leader is one who, who leads through service, right? By, by ensuring the needs of others are, are, are fulfilled. And really, that's what deacons do. I mean, uh, the elders are the ones who are older and wiser and see a need. But you can't have, you know, a group of individuals meeting the needs of a congregation of 300 people. I mean, you can't have, this more than four guys can do, or six guys, or seven guys. And so you need a group of a dozen or more individuals who are deacons that say, look, this is, this is a need that we have in the congregation. We need these men to take it as, to, to over. To, to, to run it, basically, with the, with the elders still overseeing it. But, you know, this is what, you, this is what we need you're over this. And so if you need something, you go get it. Like, you don't have to come back and ask us, you know, every time you want to, you know, it's like uh, the guy who's in charge of maintenance, right? He's, he's in charge. I mean, he doesn't have to go and ask the elders to buy three screws at Ace Hardware for 10 cents a piece. You know, he doesn't have to do that because he's been given the commission that, hey, that, that there's something broke, you, you fix it, brother. And so that has been laid at his charge. And, uh, and, and whether we make the illustration with the deacon in charge of, of, of uh, benevolence or maintenance or, you know, uh, the vehicles or transportation or the shut-ins, or whatever it is, right? They've been given a charge, and it's a duty. And it's a great thing for the Lord's church to have individuals who will step up uh, because um, there are congregations throughout the brotherhood, and uh, oftentimes we don't realize this, but when men fail to step up to leadership whether it's ministry or whether it's deacons or whether it's elders, the church congregation locally suffers and the church worldwide suffers. And so oftentimes it's, a, it's, it's not good. I know sometimes it's, we have the idea of trying to be um, noble and transfer. Like I don't, you know, I don't want to be in charge. I don't, I don't have any ambition, right? Sometimes in our culture, ambition is bad. It's not an ambition thing. It's, it's a service thing. If we have the ability, uh, we should do that. And someone who's darkly sound. And of course, this doesn't really need much, uh, uh, much breakdown. You need to have somebody in those positions who know the Bible, who know the gospel, who are sound when it comes to doctrine. And so uh, that's an important thing in the church. And also someone who manages their family well. And of course here it talks about the spouse and the children. It says a deacon has to be the husband of one wife. And it says they have to manage their family well. Uh, and of course, uh, why is that important? Yeah. And so if they can't, if they can't handle the responsibility of their spouse or their children, how can they handle the responsibility of the Lord's house. That's not a negative thing, it's not a bad thing, but it's just, just the way it is. You know, it's just, you know, you need to, need to prove yourself. The Bible says that once they have proved themselves, let them be deacons. Well, how do they prove themselves? Well, they have these qualities, and one of those qualities is, is their families. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, it's important uh, because 
they have to manage their own household well. Uh, the Bible tells us that the relationship between a, a, a husband and a wife is a beautiful relationship, but yet both clearly have defined roles. Um, and the man has certain responsibilities, and the woman has certain responsibilities. And we live in a day and age where um, fatherhood and has been subjected to ridicule and uh, media and sitcoms. And, I mean, if you watch TV, the dad is always like the dumb idiot. You know what I'm saying? That's like, you know, just the laugh of the sitcom. Um, we live in a world where strong fathers and strong husbands who are heads of the household are a rare thing, which is sad because I think that's contributing to the breakdown of our society as a whole. Um, but in the church, it should not be so. We should still have individuals who lovingly oversee their households, not domineering, not mistreating, uh, but as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. Uh, does Christ love the church? Absolutely. You know, Acts 20, 28 says he, he purchased it with his own blood. Uh, but he's still the head, right? And he still has, he, he still exercises that authority. So, any questions on any of these qualifications? No? Okay. Really? Nobody's going to ask about, like, somebody whose wife's deceased or, like, They've got six kids and one's unfaithful. None of that? Oh, you guys are making it easy on me this morning, all right? <laughs> so, like, I open a can of worms. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> Nobody asked. We're moving on. <laughs> Just playing. Um, uh, those, those, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's that age old thing like if you send your kid to the grocery store, do you give them a list of things to buy and things not to buy? You know, and uh, you know, if you give them a list of things to buy, it automatically, you know, X's out everything else in the department store. And so, uh, absolutely. Um the, the, the reason why the manager's family and the question about spouses who are deceased or divorced or kids uh, that are, you know, unfaithful once they leave the home, one of the reasons why those are such juicy topics is because everybody has an opinion on those topics, and oftentimes the opinions differ. And uh, so um, the Bible says what it says clearly. Now, of course, when it comes to managing family, we have to make a judgment call on what that means when it's applied to our families when there's a case of someone who's been remarried, whether their spouse has been unfaithful, whether their spouse has been deceased, whether they've got multiple kids. And they've, they've, I'll give you Isaac's opinion because I, I think that it's an opinion based. I think the Bible says, you know, you should be modest. Well, we can discuss what modesty is. The Bible says that you've got to manage your family well. You've got to be the husband and wife. Uh, the Bible says in Matthew 19 that when you are married, you're married for life. And there are only two things that break those covenantal vows. One of those is death, one of those is adultery. And so when that takes place, you're no longer married. Um, and so if someone, like most, some congregations, if a husband's wife left him, uh, cheated on him, and he had a scripture divorce, and he got remarried, um, I think he's the husband of one wife. The Bible tells us that that covenantal relationship in the eyes of God has been broken. Uh, I think some people would say, if I went to a congregation and the elder said, we don't do that here, I'd be, I, that's fine. Like, I'm not going to fight that because I, I think it's fine. Um, but if I went to a congregation and there were deacons or, or even elders who were, had been, you know, scripture divorced or their wife had been deceased, they're still the husband of one wife. They're not practicing polygamy, which was still uh, used in the first century uh, context here. Um, as far as kids, uh, and I'll ask your, your questions here in a moment. Um, it, they've got to manage their household well. And so if they've got five kids and one's unfaithful, hey, four out of five is not bad. And so I'm okay with that. If they got five kids and four is unfaithful, four out of five is not very good in that circumstance. And so I think some discretion needs to be made. Those are Isaac's opinions. Uh, so there you go. Uh, John? Yeah, we've been talking about the qualifications, each qualification and why. I think for all the qualifications, you know, it's important for me to, you know, to meet these qualifications for certainly 
as an example, <coughs> not only to those inside the church, but outside the church, a deacon out of line to destroy the reputation of the whole church. Absolutely. How many country music songs you heard, stories or jokes, and all uh, talk about deacons, you know, doing mm -hmm. this or that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That's right. And so, like John was saying, anytime we uh, have a position, anybody who does anything brings shame and reproach upon the church. But if, especially if someone in a position of, of authority and, and an official role, whether a deacon or elder or a minister. Absolutely. And so they're a vital part of the church. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. Philippians 1, 1, Paul writes to the church in Philippi with the overseers or elders and the deacons and the rest of the saints. And so here you have a clear distinction that there are elders, there are deacons. Acts 6, 1-7, through 7, a passage Brother Alvin already read for us. Uh, the church was growing rapidly, and the people needed to be served. Because people were in need of being helped, both inside the church and outside the church. And Paul said, we cannot leave the Word of God to serve tables. Not that serving tables isn't good. They said, we need somebody to serve tables, but we can't do it. And so we need... All people joining in together and taking whatever talent they have and doing those things. Too often we have cheapened the position of deacon in the church. I'm not saying here, but I've been in a lot of congregations where the preacher does the work of the elders, the elders do the work of the deacons, and the deacons are just, you know, Jim's been a deacon for 30 years. What does he do? I don't know. He only comes half time, but he's still a deacon. You know, like that can't be what a deacon is. A deacon is an important and vital role in the service of the church. And they ought to be utilized. And they ought to be given um, responsibilities and things to do. Our time is short. Why be a deacon? Because it's an effective use of your talents. In Matthew 25, 14 through 30, the Bible tells us that those who have taken their talents and used them effectively, God will bless. But he also tells us that there are those who refuse to use their talents and they'll be punished. Um, if you're a man and you meet the qualifications of a deacon, don't just throw your hands up and say, I ain't going to be a deacon. Remember Matthew 25, 14 through 30. You have a responsibility first and foremost to Christ. I'm not trying to strong arm you. I'm just saying, if you've got a serious apprehension about being a deacon, we can talk about that. But if it's just a, I don't want to do it, well, you know, there's a lot of things we don't want to do but as Christians, I'm not the master of my body or soul. Christ is. And so think about that. You know, Don't throw those talents away. Uh, it increases one's faith. 1 Timothy 3.13, If you do the, uh, the more you put in, the more you get out. Just like this sermon this morning. If you become a deacon and you put in your heart and soul into that, you will see uh, a reward to your faith in the congregation. And it aids the gospel to be spread in the growth of the congregation. If you have a congregation that's got good deacons who are involved, who are dialed in, who are doing their part, the congregation is going to grow. If you have a congregation where the deacons are not dialed in or a congregation that is lacking in deacons, the congregation is not going to grow as the Lord intended. Um, yes? I think it's important to remember one other little thing. I knew of a congregation in the adjacent county to here mm -hmm. who during a period of time during the Depression and the turmoil of World War II went for years without appointing any new elders, any new leaders. Mm -hmm. After the war, all of a sudden, all the elders but one died. Mm -hmm. The church building burnt when it was struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. They appointed a series of elders and I think deacons who had never had experience of anything suddenly mm -hmm. to replace the other five or six or whatever that had died within a two-year period. Mm -hmm. Within three years, the church had split. Yeah. Uh, the old build, the people who kept the old building, I think, continued to decline in numbers compared to what they have been. It's important that you continue to plug in new leaders new workers, new servants as time goes back. And that's not to run anybody off. Yeah. It's just that you don't need to be left top heavy and all of a sudden everybody's gone. That's, that's absolutely true. And last slide, I know we've got to go. I'm uh, so sorry for uh, the time. Serving as a deacon in the Lord's Church is an amazing honor, privilege, and responsibility. It is not something that should be taken lightly, nor is it something that should be avoided. Those capable and qualified to be deacons should welcome the opportunity to serve. 
And so, uh, as men, that should be our goal. Lord willing, I hope one day I am a deacon. Uh, Lord willing, I hope one day I can be qualified to be an elder. And as, as men in the Lord's church, that should be all of our goals. And so, uh, don't shy away from the responsibility if you have the ability to do that. Let's close in prayer. Thank you so much for all your comments and, and questions this morning. Dear Lord, we're so thankful for this congregation at the Chapel Hill Church of Christ. We're so thankful for all the hard work that is being done by the elders and the deacons currently. We're so thankful for each and every individual member of this congregation and for all the work that they do to support the church here at Chapel Hill and to spread the gospel throughout this community and the world. Dear Heavenly Father, as we enter this, in this time of seeking out and appointing new deacons, please be with the men who are qualified. Uh, give them the... Um, the determination to serve you in whatever capacity that is, whether that's a deacon or whether that's just an active member. Uh, please be with those in the congregation to support their elders and their deacons, to let them know how much they are appreciated and how much the work means to the church here at Chapel Hill. And please be with us as your servants to serve those in this congregation and those outside this congregation. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.